Good morning. I'm Bill Jepson, and welcome to the Grand Tour of Greece. Uh, got a good crowd here. Uh, we usually are in the other community room, but we weren't able to do that today, so I uh, hope you can see these screens. Uh, but I am a uh, retired world history and uh, geography teacher that lives in Minnetonka, but I had uh, students in, I went to, I taught at Hopkins and at Eden Prairie High Schools. Is that better? Yes. Okay. And uh, after, oops, after living in Athens for four months when in 1975 during college, uh, it was our junior spring. Uh, we lived in Athens and every weekend we had four days off. We were off with our college classes at, at noon on Thursday and we would go to different islands or different places. So I'm gonna give you a tour of all the wonderful places in Greece. And since I, uh, I thought I would be going back soon after that, way back in 1975, but then it was many years until I was teaching uh, and teaching social studies that I, uh, oh, thank you, um, that I realized that I could take students overseas and every six students, the teacher goes for free with EF tours. So I thought, wow, I'm gonna I was in a small alternative program for at-risk students in Eden Prairie. And these students, uh, a lot of them had ADHD. And, and uh, so therefore, they, they had a short attention span. They didn't do well with lectures. And so they needed to experience things. And that's how they learned. So I started this program. And about eight times, we went to Europe and uh, China. And so I've been giving these presentations. The last one was on China, or 10 days there in 2007. And then uh, we would go to Paris, Italy. Those are two of our other presentations that I may be doing again in the spring, the Paris one and the Italy one. But, uh, but in 2003 and 2009, we went over there. In fact, here's a picture of me on the left in 1975 and on the right in 2003 and with our students in front of the Parthenon. I had that beard only for about a year or so back then. And so let's get our passports and hop on a plane, go over to Europe. Um, it takes 12 hours flight time. And usually you stop in Amsterdam or Frankfurt on the way. And uh, it's about eight hours ahead in Athens. So there's quite a bit of jet lag when you get there. Here's Greece, you can see. Well, I'm not able to point here. Uh, like I could in the other room, but anyway, I'll just direct you to the very bottom right is Greece on the Europe map, if you don't know. And so Greece is this uh, beautiful country, mostly with islands and uh, dry mountainous, you know, valleys and, and so many years of history, 3,000 years of history that you'll learn about today. Uh, how many of you have been to Greece? Oh, quite a few. Well, at least this side. <laughs> they seem to be all. Uh, so today we'll visit uh, Athens, Delphi, Olympia, Mycenae, Epidaurus, and Sunyan. Um, if you haven't heard of these, we'll tell you more about each one. And then we'll head out to the islands and go to some of the biggest ones, uh, their most popular ones, Mykonos, Crete, Santorini, and Rhodes. So we arrive in Athens and head over to our hotel. Quite often they have a view of the Acropolis here with uh, your infinity pool. You know what an infinity pool is? where You don't see the railing and it just kind of goes off. And uh, here they're eating dinner on the right. The bottom left is uh, the Athens Hilton. Very nice, uh, 130 dollars a night. I was just checking this week. And uh, that's a statue called Running out front that was put there for the Olympics in 2004. 
So usually I recommend on the first night when we get there to go up on uh, Mount Likavitos. It's this mountain on the upper left that uh, sticks up out of Athens. And uh, when I lived there for four months, we lived in this neighborhood down below, just three blocks away from the funicular. You can take a, a funicular kind of a, a ski lift at a diagonal uh, for seven euros round trip. Or you can walk up, which takes about a half an hour. And there's a magnificent view of Athens from there, from all sides, but especially people want to look towards the Acropolis. You can kind of see it at the upper right, uh, the Parthenon, and on top of the Acropolis. And in the center is the Parliament and Syntagma Square, the main square in the center of Athens. And to the upper left is the Temple of Olympian Zeus, which is a Roman temple. Uh, and in the distance, you can see the Mediterranean Sea. So here's a closer look at the Acropolis when you zoom in. And, and uh, we'll take a tour of that pretty soon here. And on the upper left, especially if you go up there the first night, maybe before you take your long sleep to get off the... Uh, to off the jet lag, um, and it's all lit up every night, which is really magnificent. And the view from the other side, uh, looking toward, in the bottom left picture, looking towards Mount Likavitos in the distance. And so here's a map of Athens, and Mount Likavitos is up in the upper right, the green area. And then you're looking down towards the Acropolis in the bottom left area. Um, and in the middle is Syntagma Square and the Parliament and the gardens, the National Gardens, which are beautiful too. And so after a long sleep to get rid of the jet lag, let's uh, take a tour of the Acropolis. Here's what it looks like as you get closer it's an old photograph of mine in the upper left with an electric bus. <laughs> and and uh, it's just amazing when you come upon it and you think that it was, it's 2,400 years old. I mean, the oldest thing in, in the United States that we see our whole life is 300 years old. And then it's awe-inspiring to be around these buildings that are uh, 3,000 years old and everything since too. Uh, so the first day in the upper right, the first day in 1975, there was an old, there's hardly anybody there in January. Uh, and there was an old photographer with a, with a huge camera and he just took one photograph there for $4. Uh, but you can see how long ago. Um, here's a view of the Acropolis from the top on the bottom left there with the Parthenon. And then we'll look at the Erechtheion as well next to it. And the flag of Greece here on the bottom right with uh, the blue and white stripes and the Greek Orthodox Christian cross on it. And so here's a reproduction or, or a depiction of what it looks like uh, looked like back in 432 BC is when the Parthenon was finished by Pericles during the Golden Age of Greece. Acropolis means high city. Acro, like acrophobia is fear of heights. Acro is height. And polis sounds familiar because of Minneapolis. They took mini, the Native American word for water, and put it under the Greek word. We also get words like police and politics from, from that. But that's the Acropolis is the whole complex. And, uh, and as you walk up, we're going to walk up through the Propylaea, these steps in the front, that's the entrance, and, uh, and we'll first see the Parthenon up close. Here's the Propylaea, and uh, it uh, was under renovation quite a bit in 2003 when we went there because the Olympics were going to be the following summer in 2004. But uh, when you turn around and look the other way, you get the picture on the bottom right, which is the Agora with the um, 
temple to Hephaestus in the middle of it, another temple. And this is where, especially the rock on the left in that picture is called the Nyx, or P-N-Y-X, and that's where democracy be was, was born. In the picture in the upper right, you see Pericles talking to, or speaking to his uh, citizens, which were only land-owning men, of course, in those days. But they did get to vote for their leaders back in the 400s BC. And so uh, here's, once you go through the Propylaea and you, you get your first close-up look of the Parthenon, I usually sit down with my students here and talk to them about how much this, this is a, uh, a perfect example of architecture which has influenced all so many buildings around the world, including our Supreme Court, our White House, here's the Lincoln Memorial in the bottom right, with its perfect uh, Doric columns. And uh, in, in the upper right, you can see the, the east view of it. You come upon it from the west on the left, and then from the other side is the upper right view. And here's what it looks, or a depiction of what it looked like back in the day. Uh, they've recently found out that it's beautifully painted, uh, whereas we're just used to the white marble. It is disintegrating from the pollution and the car exhaust, so they're f trying to, uh, to renovate it and, and preserve it. You can see in the upper left the difference between when it was colored and when when it's uh, just white marble. And it's interesting, a thousand years after it was built, around 450 AD, the temple was converted into a Christian church at the end of the Roman Empire. And then a thousand years later, it became a Muslim mosque uh, when the Ottoman Turks took over. And in 1687, uh, you can see how it's kind of pulverized in the middle there because the, the Turks kept their ammunition in there and then they were seized by the Venetian Navy. The, the Venetians lobbed a cannonball in there and blew, <laughs> blew up the whole thing. So that part's not be able to be restored. And you can't walk on it anymore, but uh, back in 75, there I am in the upper right, standing right where the 40-foot uh, gold-covered statue to Athena was. Athena was the goddess of wisdom that it was dedicated to. And many famous people have been there, many presidents, Clinton, Bush, Obama. And in here, this smiling picture of Jackie Kennedy Onassis back in the 60s. And so here's kind of a layout. You can see on the left the uh, Propylaea that we walked through the entrance and then we saw the Parthenon, we walked around it. Now we're gonna go over to the Erechtheion. It's called on, uh, above uh, to the uh, north of the Parthenon. And then you walk over to the right where there's a, a museum and you see a lot of the sculptures that were there. And then you look, we're gonna look down on the two theaters here. So here's the Erechtheion, which is a unique Ionic temple with the famous Caryatids. The Caryatids are these columns in the shape of maidens. Um, there's a close up of the face of one of them and notice, well, you can't quite see, but they're ionic columns. The ionic had a, um, a scroll at the top. It was supposed to depict uh, paper or papyrus. Uh, the Doric columns were this, uh, the other type of column, and that is on the uh, Parthenon. And then the third kind we'll see is Corinthian. So Doric, ionic, and Corinthian orders uh, kind of define the architecture. Um, 
So, and this also has an olive tree always there because Athena dedicated the city, the sacred olive tree. And she always has an owl on her shoulder with the, the symbol of wisdom telling her the truths of the world. And on the left, upper left, uh, is this new, just a few years ago, they built a, uh, a new museum for the Erechthean and the Caryat. It's kind of as a, a dig uh, to the British because they've been wanting to get those Caryatids back, those statues back. They're in the British Museum because Lord Elgin, the British, um, uh, well, he took them in the late 1800s, and they don't like that. Uh, as we look down, uh, we see a few things below the Acropolis. The Theater of Dionysus is five, was uh, is dedicated to the god of wine and pleasure, and it was built in 500 B.C., but it's not very well preserved. A lot of the steps and everything were, seats were take, carted off to build other uh, buildings over the centuries. But much more well preserved is the Odeon of Herodotus Atticus. You can see on the right, looking up, you see the Parthenon above it. And this has a local connection because Yanni, uh, who came here in 1972 after being born in in uh, Greece. You might have listened to his music, but, but uh, in 1993 he had a live album f from the Acropolis that broke all records and was uh, the best-selling music concert video of all time. Yanni, kind of easy listening orchestral music. And you look down one of the other sides, uh, the east side, and one of my favorites is this Temple of Olympian Zeus because it's much uh, younger. It's only uh, was built in 132 AD during the Roman Empire by Hadrian. Here's Hadrian's arch leading up to it. And there's only a few columns in one corner left. And think about it, these columns were all put up, uh, there are 104 of them, 60 feet tall, to uh, support a timber wooden roof. So it's before the idea of the, of the dome came in and with the Romans a little bit later. So anyway, uh, one of the columns tipped over, you can see in the bottom right, it was uh, tipped over in a windstorm in the 1800s. And then when you look down on the north side, you see the agora. Agora means field or marketplace. And that's where the center of ancient Athens, where everyone gathered to, to shop and to then go up on the hill and vote. And uh, sitting in the middle of it is the Hephaestion, which is the most well-preserved temple in Greece. And it's dedicated to Hephaestus, the god of fire and ironworking, metalworking. And bottom right is the octagonal Tower of the Winds in the next to the Agora, which has uh, eight different sculptures on it facing each way for the different winds. But next to that is the Placa, and it's a huge area at the base of the Acropolis that is for shopping uh, in restaurants and it's a favorite place for my students to go. Here they are buying uh, you know, leather goods and woolen sweaters. He's trying on a bronze replica mask or helmet rather. And bottom left is natural sponges. You don't see that around here much but they dive for those sponges and then dry them out. And uh, lots of chess sets and musical instruments, all kinds of things. And on the left here, this little boy came and was selling roses uh, for a kiss. <laughs> he was really cute. And on the right, uh, back in the 70s, this man every couple of weeks would walk up and down the street with a baboon who would do flips and he'd be 
playing his tambourine, we'd throw some drachmas down. Drachmas were the coins back then. And these are four screen captures from videos. I just wanted to let you know, because you might not realize that just in the last few years, there's been a, uh, a, a great thing on YouTube where you can just type in the word walking tour. And there's people who've gone around the world, and there's quite a few in Greece. Uh, if you just put walking tour, the Plaka, or the Acropolis, or Paris, or China, wherever you want to go, and they'll walk slowly around for just from eye level with a camera, and uh, just so you can listen to the people talking in the other language. You really feel like you're there if you've put it on a big screen. And so I would encourage you to do that. Walking tours. Um, the currency uh, today is euros. A euro is 0.87 cents to the US dollar. Or in other words, $100 is 115 euros. And uh, when I first went there, it was drachma. Uh, up until 2001, drachmas were 3.8 three cents each, and so we had to figure that out. It was kind of tricky, <laughs> 33 to the dollar. Uh, Greek food. So all this walking is getting me hungry, so uh, we let's check out some of the foods. Of course, gyros on the upper right. It's not gyro, it's gyros. And that, of course, is uh, sliced lamb in a pita bread with tzatziki sauce, which is cu cucumber and yogurt. And then to the right of that is souvlaki, which is lamb skewered with lemons on top. And then saganaki, if you've been in a Greek restaurant, they take uh, gravira cheese and light it on fire, and then they go, opa, and sometimes the flames go, start the ceiling on fire, that has happened. <laughs> But it's really fun, and then you eat it with uh, pita bread. Bottom left is uh, Greek salad, of course, with olives, onions, tomatoes, cucumbers, and a big slab of feta goat cheese. And then calamari, which is usually battered here, but over there they often have it pickled. And then, of course, dessert, you got to have bak baklava, which is uh, crushed walnuts and honey with phyllo pastry. Oops. And here's a uh, typical Greek menu. Some of the other things, moussaka, just like a lasagna. Uh, spanakopita, spanakopa means spinach, and pita means pie, so spanakopita, spinach pie, teropita is cheese pie, and uh, doma, these are stuffed grape leaves. You probably recognize some of these. And uh, on the right are just a couple of views of how the, of the tavernas and restaurants in Plaka, of which there's a hundred of them. And so a great place to hang out at night. And then, uh, what do you drink when you're there? <laughs> when we were uh, 20 years old uh, in a foreign country where you could drink when you're 12 years old, we enjoyed the uh, Greek beers quite a bit. Uh, like. Fix, Ellis, Ellis means Greece, Fix and Mythos, and then we drink Greek wines like Retsina. Retsina means resin because it tastes kind of like the pine resin of, of the pine cast that it's uh, aged in. And then you finish it off with a shot of ouzo, which is licorice aperitif. On the left here, you can see we've had a little bit too much Retsina. I'm doing the, uh, the victory sign over them on the top. Um, then, of course, you want to uh, dance. And here, uh, you probably recognize. And so uh, you've probably seen Zorba the Greek with Anthony Quinn and Alan Bates dancing at the end. Uh, wonderful movie from the 50s and has the big 
speeds up at the end and everybody's trying to dance. They have this tradition of buying plates, uh, a stack of plates, and then they smash them on the dance floor and everybody dances. Here's a Greek wedding in the upper right. And the men have these special dances which we tried to figure out. It's hard for us because it's not in 4-4 four, four time, it's in 11-4 time, so you have to count 11. If, but anyway, it uh, brings back great memories. And stop there. <laughs> and another thing is uh, I wrote this uh, diary every day and I'd like to encourage you guys uh, if you go or, or perhaps if you decide to help send a young relative to Europe I recommend you have them write a diary like my mother did and I didn't think I could do it but wow six months and what a great treasure it is to read back when you're 20 years old now that I'm almost 70 and uh, and see the things I was interested in mostly you know the girls and just all this. <laughs> it's just like, what about the history of this place? Uh, but anyway, it's fascinating, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, always on the uh, tour of Athens is the National Museum, where you have, uh, of course, bronze statues and sculptures, and then different uh, vases uh, with red figure, which is red figures on black background and black figure, which is black figures on red background. So it's a great museum. And then Syntagma Square is a place where you see the parliament where the prime minister lives <clears throat> and you feed the pigeons. And then there's these Evzonans. Evzonans are uh, soldiers uh, Greek soldiers, they, they don't look very manly to us in our culture, but they are the strongest and most elite soldiers in Greece, even though they're wearing little tunics and white white uh, tights and little pom-poms on the end of their toes, the toes of their, uh, of their sh shoes. Here's an old uh, Evzonen posing with my students on the bottom right. And a few blocks over is the Panathaic Stadium, which is the modern Olympic Stadium, which started up again in 1896. And so, of course, I had my students run a 440 around it, and it was a lot of fun. And so I lived in this uh, neighborhood up by Mount Likavitos, and I checked it out. The Airbnbs, you can still rent there for... Um, $50 a day, less than $100 a day. Um, once you get on the, the flights to, to Greece are about 800 bucks, but once you get there, things are pretty cheap. And so our place, we were pretty lucky because in the picture on the left, we are on the first floor balcony. So every Friday there was a fruit and vegetable market and we would look down and see this view on the right, bottom right and just listen to all the Greeks buying their uh, fruits and vegetables. It was a wonderful experience. And the butcher shop across the street had always had these goats, carcasses hanging out, or lamb, and that's the way they do it there to show that it's fresh. Uh, another part of the culture shock of Greece is the, the lettering, the Cyrillic alphabet. Like the Russians, they use this alphabet where P's are R's and R's are upside down U's and uh, D's are triangles and so forth. Um, so it was a little, it was actually kind of fun to get used to. But often things are in English also, like on the left. Um, so now let's head out of Athens to the Peloponnese. The Peloponnese is this huge southwestern section in the yellow there on the, on the map on the right. Uh, of Greece, which is where a lot of the history is and a lot of the famous ruins. Um, and we'll visit a few places like uh, Mycenae and Olympia here in Delphi, is uh, nearby. And so first let's go to Mycenae. 
one of the oldest ancient cities dating back to 1,200 years before Christ. And so this gate has been there that long, the Lion's Gate I'm standing under, and uh, a depiction of it on the right. But this is the entrance to Mycenae with the two headless lions above the lintel. The stone on the top is, uh, they say, is 20 tons. And there was no mortar. And this has been there for all these centuries. You might have seen some scenes from this uh, in the movie The Troy. Uh, the Iliad is, is, has a big section of it on Mycenae and Agamemnon on the right. Um, remember, Homer was the blind poet who orally spoke these stories, and it's considered the oldest book besides the Bible that we still have. Some other uh, recent hit movies are Clash of the Titans and The 300, if you want to see them. But uh, here is uh, the map of Mycenae and an aerial view. You can see the Lion's Gate in the bottom left. And we walk in there, and then uh, it's in this huge valley, so they could see when the enemies were coming. Um, but it's all been destroyed for many centuries. And on the right is the f grave circle with the famous uh, treasures from Mycenae that were found in the 1800s. Uh, they always call this the Mask of Agamemnon, but it's been disproven that it's really his mask uh, in the upper left. But uh, but they found lots of jewelry and gold there, and, but most of the buildings are destroyed today. In much better shape is uh, Epidaurus, which is just a couple hours or an hour away on the bus. And this is an extremely well-preserved theater in this, uh, this uh, archaeological site, which has many buildings and it was actually kind of like the ancient Mayo Clinic. It was for health, for older folks to go there and get better with the spas and, and everything. And, and uh, anyway, uh, when you come upon it, it's just incredible. It it's, was well-preserved because for a thousand years it was buried until the 1800s. Uh, it was actually... Yeah, Finished in 340 BC, held 13,000 specters, spectators. But at the end of the Roman Empire, when they wanted to cover up the pagan sites, uh, the Christian Romans uh, covered it, and so it was well preserved. And the main feature of it is the acoustics. So people come from around the world, especially with church groups here, uh, and they record themselves singing there, but you can actually whisper uh, when you're standing on the stage and your friend up in the very highest seats can hear the, hear the whisper from way down there. It's, a, it's amazing how you can do that. And they have, every summer, they have many productions still today. And so that's uh, Mycenae and Epidaurus. Uh, nearby is Naphleon, where there's a beautiful castle on the hill overlooking the harbor uh, called Pomodia, and with many steps to climb up. That's just one thing to do, but let's head over to Olympia, the famous site way on the west side. It takes a number of hours on your bus to get there. <clears throat> and this is where there was a, uh, a uh, one of the seven wonders of the world, the temple to Zeus, the king of the gods, it's all destroyed now. All that's left is a couple columns standing. Um, but there's many buildings there. And of course, this is where the Olympics started. This is what it used to look like in the upper right. And the, the Olympics started there in 776 BC and lasted for about 400 years. And, um, and then, as I said before, the they uh, were reborn in 1896 in Athens, uh, but every four years they would compete. 
and all the people from the region would come around to do all these different, you know, sports, um, like in the picture in the bottom right. And so when you, one of the only things standing there is this uh, arch over the entranceway to the stadium. And so here again, I had my students run a 440, which I did back in the 70s and then again. But it's kind of cool to think of the hundreds of years of uh, like 10,000 spectators watching as uh, races and wrestling and everything were happening. <clears throat> and then we head uh, north a little bit on the other side of the Gulf of Corinth is Delphi, the famous sacred site. Uh, and it's uh, usually shown with this tholos in the middle of the sanctuary to Athena. That's kind of been on a lot of posters as the symbol of Greece. And the chariot, bronze charioteur that's so well preserved on the right. But uh, and you're not supposed to climb on it anymore, but uh, we were the only ones there in 1975, so of course I had to do that. In 2003 I didn't, um, but it's, there's only three columns left, but it used to have 20 columns around. But that's just part of Delphi. Uh, the reason it's there is because of the fumes that would come out of the mountainside. It's all this kind of built on this mountain with this huge view of the valley and uh, there's springs coming out of there and there would be a Delphic oracle, also called a Sibyl, who would breathe those fumes and go into a trance and then spout these different visions and the priests would, uh, would then interpret those and tell the people uh, what she said, what the gods were saying that she, that you would have a <clears throat> bear a son, uh, perhaps, or you would win the battle next week, or whatever. And uh, you kind of think about the zodiac uh, with all the Greek constellations uh, that that's still used today to predict the future with astrology. And this Amphilos. Uh, on the bottom center is was considered the navel of the earth where Zeus uh, consecrated it back then. <clears throat> That's also in Delphi. And you start walking up the sacred way <clears throat> to uh, these different uh, buildings. And the main one is the Temple of Apollo here on the upper left. You can see what it looked like on the right, uh, all colorful. But there's just a few uh, columns left, but it was a magnificent uh, temple back then. And so that's where they would sacrifice the goats or whatever to the gods and hope that they would be good to them. You walk up a little farther and there's an amazing uh, amphitheater with this view of the valley in the distance, also with very good acoustics. And you just keep climbing up. And at the top is a stadium where, uh, again, you know, student participation. Uh, okay, guys, let's wrestle, because here we are. You'll never forget it the rest of your life that when you were young, you wrestled in the Olympic or the, the stadium. It, instead of the Olympics here, they called it the Pythian Games. And so in Delphi, it was the two years before and after the Olympic Games in Olympia. And uh, there's a painting of the wrestlers in the bottom right. But of course, we did that. It's a lot of fun. Let's look at some other sites. Uh, Meteora is quite different. It's up in northern Greece, north of Delphi. And this is a Byzantine site with Greek Orthodox monasteries built on top of these sandstone cliffs. There used to be a dozen of them, now there's <coughs> six of them today. And uh, they would haul 
by rope all their supplies and food <clears throat> up to the top. There was a James Bond movie made there too, For Your Eyes Only, but it's incredible. You can go uh, take a elevator up to them now. <clears throat> Another, the last place on, uh, that most people go to on their last day, they take a, an hour trip down south from Athens to watch the sunset over the Aegean Sea from the Temple of Poseidon at Sunyan. You can see the bottom left of the map. Uh, it's right on the tip, so it was a place where they thought they could appease the god of the sea, Poseidon, also called Neptune. There's a picture of him with his trident in the middle, and one of my pictures in the bottom right. And so now let's head out to the islands. I'm looking for the time. Okay, uh, this is Piraeus, and uh, this is the main harbor where everybody takes off from. Uh, it's about a half an hour south of Greece. You can see, uh, south of Athens, you can see all the ferries here that you're going to take. Here's, and the Greek islands are in different categories. Uh, the Ionian islands, upper left, the Cyclades in the middle, the Dodecanese. Uh, there's 6,000 islands, but only about 240 of them are inhabited. And so we'll go to a few of them here, just kind of a quick run through. Corfu is in the very upper northwest, kind of close to Italy. So uh, it's a very lush island, very beautiful. This is uh, this stunning La Cerna monastery sitting out on this tiny island on the sea. The water is extremely blue, different shades of turquoise. Uh, it's very beautiful. And on the bottom right, we rode motorcycles, I always say, one of the funnest times in my life, $20 a day, gas included, for a Suzuki 250. But the accelerator broke, so <laughs> I'm uh, trying to fix it here after we were an hour away. And so uh, I ended up having to pull the cable out from the right instead of twisting the, the grip. So that was kind of tricky riding it back with Jeannie on the back. So, but I made it. But look at how beautiful Corfu is, different beaches and and resorts there. The water, by the way, in Greece is not only blue, uh, but you can see 50 to 100 feet underneath it. It's just very clear Mediterranean Sea. A newer uh, popular island nearby is Zakynthos uh, because of in 1980 there was a shipwreck there and uh, they say they call it Smuggler's Cove because uh, the about 30 local Greeks were arrested for looting the cargo <laughs> in this and you can only get there by boat uh, but it's a breathtaking view and and a lot of ferries or small boats you can rent to go there and just spend the day in the sun swimming. And so those were on the west side of Greece. Now to go back over to the Aegean, where most of the islands are, you go through the Corinth Canal. You can see in the map in the upper left, it, it, uh, it's four miles long, built about 100 years ago but they actually tow these ferries through it with only a couple feet of clearing on either side, but it gets, gives you a, saves you a day and a shortcut, so it's kind of fun to do. I haven't done it, but, but uh, we've driven over the top of the Corinth Canal and stopped and looked down uh, as we go to uh, the Peloponnese. Uh, there's a number of islands close to Athens, I like Agana and Poros, but uh, one of my favorites is Idra, not Hydra, but Idra, and uh, it's it's they don't allow cars there, like on a lot of the islands, and so that you just ride around on donkeys, or you can have a small uh, Vespa or motorbike too. But it's a very well preserved Greek village, and uh, a lot of 
famous people have have decided to stay there, like that's Leonard Cohen and Joni Mitchell, who lived there for quite a while. Uh, they weren't together, but they're writing songs together. Uh, another very popular island, especially more recently, is Milos, because of these, uh, it's a volcanic island with these uh, these cliffs that you can jump off of. And uh, you can jump from different heights. And it's very safe in the deep water. Um, and then, of course, this is where the Venus de Milo was was uh, from. They want the Venus back to, it's in, this is my picture of it in the Louvre in Paris. But Milos has many attractions, uh, you know, museums and and um, archaeological sites and just beautiful beaches to swim on. And now, uh, probably one of the most famous islands is Mykonos. And we went there a couple times. Uh, and it's got a lot of uh, nightlife. It's kind of expensive these days because it's a jet-setting uh, destination. Uh, it's very picturesque. This is the whitewashed harbor with the, with the windmills up above. And on the bottom right is called Little Venice, where you can uh, have dinner with the waves splashing just a few feet away from you. That's in the map. That's uh, Mykonos Cora, the main town that you come into. And then you walk over to the other side where the islands or the uh, beaches are on the island. Uh, the windmills are very famous. Here we, uh, on the right, we met one of the the millwright who's waving with us here. He would grind the wheat for the farmers on the island. You might remember that there's a scene in Moon Spinners with Haley's, hey, uh, with Haley Mills. And if, if you want to reminisce, go watch that. Um, there's 365 chapels on the island one for each day of the year. They're beautifully whitewashed. It's a really beautiful town here uh, with no cars again. So you just walk around different shops. And it was a labyrinth designed that way so that the pirates would come to attack the town. They would get lost in the, the labyrinth. And the uh, citizens of Mykonos would shoot down on them from the rooftops. That was their defensive strategy. And here's the mascot in, of the harbor, <clears throat> who's always there, Peter the Pen Pelican, in the middle. Uh, but it's a great place to just hang out like we did here. Here I am on, uh, there's donkeys going around. This one's delivering vegetables to a restaurant. And I'm sitting here under the uh, sign Pagota, for ice cream and souvlaki on the right. This woman here is tenderizing octopus by smashing it against the, the steps while this old fisherman is watching. And this Greek uh, in the middle is doing what all Greeks do in the afternoon, is play with their worry beads. You flip them over your fingers if you've ever done that. It's kind of fun. And uh, all the banks and everything closes, businesses close from 2 to 6 p.m. every day. Uh, kind of like a siesta in Mexico to get away from the hot sun. And then you come out and eat dinner at 8 o'clock in the evening. Here's some locals with uh, goat skin bagpipes playing for us in, in the harbor back then. And a bunch of fishermen just kind of hanging out. And, but today on the other side of the island, there's all these, uh, all these resorts where you can swim and dance to disco music or whatever. Here's Lindsay Lowens has a uh, club there, for example. And, uh, but on the upper left picture, that's my picture of us back when we were the only ones on the island back in March of 75. And now it's just, been inundated. But if you want to get away from that, you go to Delos, the sacred island. It's just 
uh, a mile off of Mykonos, and that was the center of the Athenian Empire. It held the treasure, treasure there, and no one can be born or die on that island. There's no businesses on it, just the archaeological site with beautiful mosaics and a theater and statues. So Delos. Um, a couple more here. Scopolos is recently famous because Mamma Mia, if you've seen the movie, it was all filmed there with Meryl Streep and Pierce Brosnan. But it's a beautiful island with probably the most wildlife and greenest island. Many beautiful beaches and harbors like this one on the left. Another island that's on many tours is Potmos because this was where St. John wrote the Revelations in the New Testament. Uh, and you can actually visit uh, the cave, which is inside the monastery up on the hill you see in the upper left. And the bottom left is the cave where he wrote his section of the Bible about end times. In the middle is the doorway that you go into the cave and bottom right are some of the Greek Orthodox uh, monks that uh, are, uh, yeah, that, that are uh, taking care of the priceless relics there and a mosaic to St. John. Uh, Rhodes is my favorite island. Uh, I went there a couple times to, uh, and it's not only because of the beaches and, and but, uh, well, I'll tell you in a bit, uh, but also you can't see much of the Colossus of Rhodes, which was there once in the 400s BC. It was this 60 foot statue, which is destroyed now from an earthquake a couple hundred years later, but they just have a couple of pedestals with uh, deer uh, statues on top of it now. But, but the reason why it's an amazing place is because not only does it have the old Golden Age temples there the, from 400 BC, but it has uh, the Knights of St. John, the Crusaders, built two castles there, one in the main harbor town here, and it had a wall around the whole city built in the 1300s on their way to, as a fortification on their way to the Holy Land. And uh, so Rhodes is, is, you can walk along the, the uh, wall all around the city. And, uh, but the funnest thing that we did was ride motorcycles for, again for $20 a day with gas included. And you can see in the map in the middle from Rhodes down to Lindos, which is this beautiful town with this view, this beach and a whitewashed village. And, uh, but the, it has a crusader castle surrounding a temple to Apollo from the uh, 400 BC. So as you can see here, from above, it's this castle built around the ancient temple a thousand years earlier, like nothing else on earth. And so uh, the thing to do is to ride a camel up there, I'm sorry, uh, ride a donkey up there. And uh, like in this picture here, bottom right, here's I am on one of the donkeys. Um, and I, took this picture in the upper left of me uh, pretending I'm gonna dive down 200 feet off of the thing. <laughs> and I'm so glad I didn't slip and fall and that would have been the end of my life. So in 2003, uh, my students wanted me to do it again, but I just stayed behind the wall wisely on the middle, upper middle picture. And you look down on uh, what's called St. Paul's, St. Paul's Bay because St. Paul uh, stopped here a couple times and on his uh, journeys and and so that's famous for that and the upper right is uh, the view of the castle as you first come up on it uh, but yeah Rhodes is is an amazing place lots more to see there but just uh, quickly two more islands uh, Crete and Santorini Crete is the biggest island and uh, 
when you go there, it's it's uh, about seven hours uh, to go there, either from Rhodes or a little more to go there, I think 10 hours to go from Athens. Uh, but it's the biggest island with with uh, white snow-capped mountains down the middle of it, but lots of beaches and bays and and harbors. And you come into Heraklion, Heraklion for Hercules, and it's the main town in the, in the north central part. There's a Venetian castle there uh, that's 500 years old that you can tour. Uh, but it's kind of a busy city, so you usually you want to get away uh, to see some of the sites. And the main thing, one of the main uh, sites is Canassas. It's one of about four or five Minoan uh, uh, cities that, and the most well-preserved one, Canassas, uh, excavated in the 1800s. And this is where King Minos had his labyrinth and, and uh, but uh, it has beautiful frescoes on it. Uh, in the upper right, there's dolphins. In the bottom right is uh, the queen's throne room with griffins on the wall. It was uh, buried for centuries, so well-preserved frescoes. And the bottom left uh, shows their sport of jumping over bulls from the front avoiding the horns and doing a flip over and landing on the back, uh, which was kind of a precursor to bullfighting. Because remember, this is 1,500 years before Christ. And so this is an amazing place, Canassa, so you can wander around. Um, another famous place on Crete are these uh, caves of Matala, uh, in the 1960s, uh, they had a Life magazine cover story, the hippies are living in Matala and you know, copying out and whatever. Uh, but beautiful, one of many beautiful beaches on Crete and you can rent motorcycles there like we did uh, or an ATV. I almost died uh, another time on that because I were riding behind my friend on the motorcycle and these chickens came running across the road and went right through the spokes of his motorcycle in front of me. So there's feathers everywhere and I'm going 40 miles an hour. Yeah. And then there's a truck coming the other way. And, the other, yeah. and it only lasted a few seconds, but I fortunately went straight and everything was fine, but I'll never forget that. Um, but beautiful harbors and and cities, we went to Rethmanon and then to Hanya in the upper right here. Uh, you can even see some of the snow-capped mountains there, which you wouldn't expect on a Greek island, but that's how high they are. And there's a beautiful gorge called Samaria Gorge coming out of it, uh, where people like to hike. And, uh, but the thing to do is just sit at the harbor and have some fresh seafood that was caught this morning and then go out to the beach, perhaps. And in the bottom right is a beautiful um, village of Agia Nicolas, which is one of the others. Um, and our last island is Santorini, very special to me. I've never been. I've been to Greece four times, but but uh, we are just booking a flight to go there, uh, Sue and I, uh, this March, and. Uh, because she's able to, with her laptop, she can do her job from anywhere. So we're like, why are we doing it in Minneapolis? Why don't we go someplace for a couple of weeks? They have the internet in Santorini. Uh, and so this is some of the most spectacular views on earth with this caldera here. Uh, the unique thing about Santorini is that it's this volcanic island uh, in a circle here. and uh, the main town is Thera in the middle and then with the busiest part overlooking the caldera. And in the north is Ia, O-I-A, which is uh, the, where the jet setters, the most expensive, luxurious hotels are. Um, but we're going to stay in the bottom right 
well, actually here in, in the bottom of this big aerial photograph is Parisa, because this side of the island is a, uh, is a gently sloping with uh, sandy beaches all along it, whereas the, the north side there is the, the cliff side where everybody wants to watch the sunset every night. There's different colored sands, the black sand beach in the bottom left, white sand beach and red sand beach. And, and you can see the airport there too. You can fly in for $100 from Athens, it takes a ha half an hour, or take a boat for 50 euros, um, which will take a couple hours, a few hours. Um, but a beautiful island. And most people, when they arrive on a ferry, and it's just lots of cruise ships, they come to this cliff and they want to go up to the main town, Fira, on top. And so they have three choices. You can walk up with your luggage, which takes many hours, 600 steps, forget that. Or you can ride the funicular for six euros on the upper right, which is uh, these, uh, you know, it's a, basically a ski lift, much easier, just takes a few minutes. But many people ride these donkeys uh, for 30 euro, which is a special thing to do. It's been done for thousands of years. But it's become very controversial lately uh, because uh, a lot of people feel it abuses the donkeys. There's about 400 donkeys that carry hundreds of tourists each day up the half an hour ride up. But so they've limited to, to to appease that, they've limited the weight so that if you weigh over, I think, 200 pounds, you can't go, or maybe it's 150. Um, and you may have remember the scene of Sisterhood of Traveling Pants, where she does that. If you've seen that, it's a great movie filmed on Santorini from a few years ago. And then in 1980, the one that really got a lot of people going there is Summer Lovers with Daryl Hannah. Um, that you might want to check out. But you go to Santorini, it's on a bucket list for many people because you can watch the sunset in the west over the caldera while having your dinner in a whitewashed cliffside hotel next to your infinity pool. <laughs> you see there, it's really, it's, it was on the bucket list for my father uh, at, at, when he was 73 years old, he finally went there took a lot of great pictures. and um, But here's why it's unique, is you can see the red line here on the left is the the size of the original island with Nia Kamini, the volcanic cone in the middle that blew in 1550 BC. And uh, it's blown a few times since too, but the big explosion was back then and um, destroyed the villages and the tsunamis went up to Crete and destroyed the Minoan cultures in their harbors with huge waves. Uh, and they say that's where Plato, writing in 500 BC about an event that was a thousand years before that, he wrote the story of Atlantis, the flooding of Atlantis. And they say where that's probably where he got the inspiration for that. And you can... Uh, Visit Akrotiri is the archaeological site with wonderful uh, frescoes on Santorini here, uh, like these boxers and the young f fishermen in the middle. Amazing artwork for, for being so old. The blue monkeys on the bottom right. And uh, one th other thing, last thing that you do, is uh, you usually take a day trip over to the hot springs. There's some uh, hot water coming up un underneath the center of the island, uh, of the, where the cone is in the middle. And so the water is 80 degrees there. You take a little boat trip over there and swim all day. And, uh, but now let's uh, book a reservation for a dinner overlooking the caldera, they, you can have these special dinners on your hotel or restaurant, and everybody goes there to watch the sunset. 
beautiful sunset every day. It doesn't rain very often in Santorini. And so there's the last one. Kalinikta Ellis means good night, Greece. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. If you have any questions, come on up. I'd love to talk to you. And so, and we, we may do uh, Paris and my tour of Italy again because only three people came during COVID uh, last year. So we're thinking, let's do it again next spring. So look for that. I have four of them. Thank you very much. <laughs>